for the first time in what seems like an eternity, wrestling was worth watching on Monday night again. For the first time in an eternity, it was somewhat exciting to be a wrestling fan again. I hope newbie fans, I hope they got a taste, a glimpse, a grain of sand of the excitement and thrill that we used to get as wrestling fans, not just one week, but every single week, one right after another. I hope they got an idea of just how badass it used to be to be a wrestling fan. Now, TNA and WWE, neither show was perfect, but they don't need to be perfect. Raw and War and Nitro were almost never perfect. That's not what it's all about. It's about the competitive spirit, the competitive atmosphere, the one-upsmanship. And I think we can all agree that it was pretty exciting, right? I hope the excitement of this experience helps to eliminate two stupid arguments that I've heard over and over again. The first argument, and I can't believe people actually think this, is the argument that competition is overrated. There's no connection between competition and product. What? After watching all the build-up, after watching TNA and WWE amp up for each other, and TNA throwing the kitchen sink at WWE last night, that argument should be over, done with. Think about it this way. If Hulk Hogan came back to Raw, WWE would hype it up, right? If Ric Flair came back to Raw, WWE would hype it up, right? If Jeff Hardy came back to Raw one day, I think the WWE would hype it up, right? Last night, TNA brought all these guys in at the same time, along with guys like Sting and Scott Hall. They threw the kitchen sink out there last night. Meanwhile, on the other channel, you had Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart, a showdown that's been in the making since 97, all right? The argument that competition is overrated should be done with, all right? Competition is the killer of the status quo, which is what we have been enduring for the last half decade in wrestling. Right? When there's competition, the fans win. And the more competition there is, the more the fans win. I've read people saying things like, oh, I hope WWE buys out TNA and ROH, or oh, I hope TNA and ROH go out of business. As far as I'm concerned, if you want there to be only one major wrestling promotion, if you hope WWE buys out TNA and ROH, then you are not a wrestling fan. Last night was a demonstration on how competition made wrestling watchable again. The second argument that I hope is gone is the argument for product quality using only match time. People sometimes try to play down on the attitude error by saying things like, Oh, back in this episode, it took 25 minutes until the first match, as if non-match time is automatically garbage time. Well, Shawn Michaels' Bret Hart last night was 15-20 minutes. Was that garbage time? Was the return of Hulk Hogan garbage time? Just because a match is not taking place does not necessarily mean what's there is automatically garbage. Like it or not, some of the most classic, memorable wrestling moments of all time took place outside a wrestling match. Shawn Michaels throwing Marty Jannetty through a window. Piper hitting Snooka with a coconut. Y2J debuting on Raw and confronting The Rock. The Warrior returning at WrestleMania 8. Stone Cold Steve Austin stunning McMahon at Madison Square to our garden. Shawn Michaels Bret Hart last night. I would not trade any of these moments at all for any little routine match. All right? People try to judge shows by saying, oh, there were such and such minutes during this show, therefore it sucked. Well, what if what was there was awesome? What if it was sing along with The Rock or The Return of Austin? Right? You can't judge product quality only by using match time. I hope that argument is over. Now, as far as comments on the shows go, I'm going to start with Raw since I only watched the Bret Hart parts. Other than Bret Sean and Bret Vince, my TV was on TNA 100% of the time, including commercials based on principle, gotta support the competition, and faith in product. I simply don't believe in WWE anymore. But as far as Bret Hart goes, the first thing I'd like to say is that I don't know what definition you watch the show in, but did you notice the amount of makeup Bret Hart had on his face? Oh my god! Goodness, you know, it looked like he had like a makeup party, you know, with like the diva or something right before coming down to the ring. You know, is this Bret Hart or Bret Michaels? But the important thing and the thing I was concerned about was the crowd reaction. Thank goodness that crowd gave Bret Hart a decent pop, at least in the beginning of the show, all right? They, they weren't going crazy. They weren't going berserk like the Ultimate Warrior on Nitro or the Rock in his prime. But you can't really ask for that level of pop in today's crowd, right? The most you can ask for, the best you can ask for out of crowds today is that they please be not quiet, right? And Bret Hart got his pop. 
There was plenty of pink in the crowd. Old school fans seemed to show up in bunches and made themselves heard. That's all you can really ask for out of today's crowd. No complaints. Speaking of crowds, I talked about some of the crowd reactions at Survivor Series. Going to WWE shows these days feels like I'm going to an alien planet sometimes. Going to TNA shows, on the other hand, feels like I'm going home. These here at TNA are my fellow wrestling fans. These are wrestling fans, right? At Survivor Series, they stay quiet for the Ultimate Warrior. TNA Impact starts with a reference by a fan of the Ultimate Warrior. And with Sean Waltman's walking down the ring at the Impact Zone, people are chanting, one, two, three, one, two, three. That's a reference to 1995. Yes, indeed, for the alienated wrestling fan, TNA is home. With this episode of Impact, TNA is setting up for something that could be potentially awesome in terms of storytelling. As you know, I have been so tired of the WWE's linear, simplistic, one-dimensional, cardboard style of storytelling, where storylines basically consist of, I don't like you anymore. Let's fight a few times in a row and then forget we ever fought until it's convenient again. <laughs> right? Yeah? This feud at Survivor Series, Rey Mysterio Batista and Jericho Big Show basically consisted of You're not my friend anymore! You know, come on! And then you have the Cena streaks where he just beats one person after another person after another person after another person in basically the exact same way the bad guy attacks them when we're on Raw they fight at the pay-per-view It is so old, so boring! Storylines used to be more than this. They used to be about ongoing relationships. It used to be a real fictional wrestling universe. I talked about this back in 07. The WWE used to be more than that. It used to be a living, breathing universe consisting of relationships. And the Warrior Macho Man feud was the result of the, a series of relationships. The relationship between Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair, the relationship between Hulk Hogan and The Undertaker, the relationship between Jake the Snake and The Undertaker, the relationship between Hulk Hogan and Sid Justice, the relationship between Macho Man and Ric Flair, and finally, the relationship between The Ultimate Warrior and Macho Man, among others. All these relationships giving way to a series of separate but interdependent storylines that cross paths as they develop and as the characters develop based on their motivations, personalities, and goals. That's what I'm talking about. With this episode of Impact, TNA seems to be on the verge of building something that's actually worth getting into. It's still early, we don't know how it's going to turn out, but let's take a look at things. As you know, I love Storyline. And just look at all the things we have going on here. We got the state of ownership. We got Hall and X-Pac crashing the party. We got AJ Styles proceeding with his feud with Kurt Angle. We got the knockout division title challenges. And on the side, we have Jeff Hardy in this mysterious subplot. And then, we have Foley. By the way, I love the way Foley was pulling that suitcase around no matter how mad he got. He'd yell, but then he'd just keep walking with his suitcase. Now that's personality. Foley storyline-wise has issues with ownership, sneaks his way in, runs into Val Venus, but then runs into a certain two other party crashers. Meanwhile, we have Flair wandering around, seemingly interested in talking to AJ Styles, but otherwise unexplained. All this thus far, of course, is connected by the common thread of Hogan Bischoff. What are they really here for? What is their purpose? You see what I mean when I say potential? And you still have Jeff Hardy down here with that mysterious envelope. No clue on whether he relates to any of these storylines up here. And I even haven't even touched on everything yet. Potential, potential, potential. As far as performance goes, here are the early reported ratings numbers as I record this on Tuesday, which means they may not be final. Based on these, however, Raw clearly has a higher number than TNA, as expected. However, when you look at Raw historically, it seems like they just drew a standard rating. In other words, the big return of Bret Hart only drew on par. TNA, on the other hand, drew the biggest rating in its entire history. There is no precedent for this for TNA. It stands alone as a significant audience gain. So in this sense, as far as I'm concerned, TNA wins.